stand and our speaker will yell as loud as I can because their one microphone is across the way. So we didn't get it. It's a great privilege and pleasure for me to introduce our speaker for the day. Professor Henry N. Pontell received his BA cum laude in sociology and political science in 1972, his MA in 1974, and PhD in 1979, both in sociology, all from the State University of New York at Stony Brook. He joined the UC Irvine faculty in the latter year and is now a professor, and here's where it gets a little complicated, Department of Criminology, Law, and Society in the School of Social Ecology and Professor, Department of Sociology. He's held a number of important positions in the university, including that of Chair of the Department of Criminology, etc., from 1993 to 2001. He's been visiting, visiting professor at a number of universities, including those of Hong Kong, Macau, Melbourne, Tokyo, and Australia. He's been to see an excellent thing I do to do, and I recommend it to anybody who can. <laughs> As visiting professor, semester at sea at the University of Virginia. He has held numerous research and consulting positions at universities in Australasia and North America, received numerous research grants, honors, and awards over the years, served on governmental and university committees, and been active in the five professional organizations to which he belongs. He has written, co-written, or edited 10 books, including with Stephen M. Rossoff and Robert Tillman, Profit Without Honor, White Collar Crime and the Looting of America, first published by Prentice Hall in 1998, now in its fourth edition, 2007. I have about 20 pages in my briefcase telling in detail of these and other Dr. Pontel's achievements and activities but I must stop here and leave him a bit of time to talk to you. <laughs> I will only add that I should pay special tribute to him because after all this time of looking at the dark side of our society, he's still smiling. <laughs> Again, I say it's a great pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Henry Pontel, who will tell you about malefactors who may be too big to fail, too powerful to indict, or on the absence of criminal prosecutions following the 2008 meltdown. Thank you very much, Ernie, for that very nice introduction. And let me say it's a pleasure to be here um, today. I've been at Irvine for 32 years. If my voice starts going low in the back, just yell at me. Um, I'm still aspiring to be like all of you. <laughs> very soon, <laughs> very soon, I envy all of you. Um, I'd also like to introduce my good colleague here, uh, Jill Rosenbaum, who is currently a professor at <laughs> Forgot about it and ran out of the house to get here. Uh, she's, gonna, she's going to help me today. Jill and I have known each other 30 years um, and uh, travel together and go to the ASC meetings together. My partner Godmother in of my son, very good friend, so I'm very honored that she, that she was able to get here today. So would you like to help me? I'm going to help okay, you. Okay, so I don't have to, to do. just press the button. I don't, I, don't, I don't have this high tech. I mean, I, I got PowerPoint, but I don't have the high tech. Well, you have to, do, you have to watch up here because I can't get the screen. I want to just press okay. this one until you press it. Okay. Right. This one? Yeah. Okay. Relax. You can do it, Jay. You can do it. So, uh, as Ernie said, it's really a, it's, it's kind of a chore. I mean, I'm studying white collar crime and corporate crime now for almost 30 years. Uh, did some big studies on medical fraud. I did a big study for the Department of Justice on the savings and loan scandal, which you all remember, back in the 80s and 90s, and now working on this one. So in the last 10 years or so, I decided to dedicate myself to looking at uh, the concept of fraud in financial crisis because there are lots of similarities, and I'm going to go through some of those things. We also have the Orange County bankruptcy, which you will probably remember as well, another example of fraud um, by our treasurer. I'm having trouble hearing, so I don't know if anybody else is. Well, I asked for a mic. I can't really speak much louder than this. I'm sorry. But if you want to come up here in front, that might work better. I also have a... Uh, 
a tooth problem and have a device in my mouth which is making me speak a little more softly than I normally would, so it's hard for me to project. But um, I'll do the best I can. How's that? Is that better? That's better, yeah. Okay, good. Um, so, um, where was I? Oh, we were talking about the Orange County bankruptcy, which we all remember, um, which was a, uh, a case of fraud uh, committed by a treasurer, Robert Citron, and the assistant treasurer, Matthew uh, Robb, uh, uh, using accounting uh, techniques to cover up actual losses in the county's uh, portfolio. So we have a lot of instances of fraud and crisis that uh, are interesting, and that's basically what I'll be talking about today in relation to the current one, uh, the current 2008 meltdown. So Jill, I'm just going to kill it. So to start off, try to keep our sense of humor about something which is uh, uh, quite, quite terrible. Um, just a few slides, a few things that my research assistants pulled out of the paper. Here you see the Hollywood sign, smashed. Uh, this works better with a foreign audience because they have no idea. But um, the Hollywood sign smashed, left with an IOU, California, and on the bottom the little guy is saying, we're all heading there. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know, is our uh, current president of the uh, chairman of the, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve, Ben Bernanke, I think was Time Man of the Year a couple of years ago for saving the country after the bell. Looks a little pained in this, in this picture, yes. It was, it was a very painful experience. And some of the things that Bernanke said before he became Man of the Year or Person of the Year uh, were just absolutely dead wrong from, it, from uh, an empirical perspective. You know, the economy is on sound fundamentals. This is two years before it crashes. <laughs> Next slide, please. And he's still in charge, which is very scary. That's scary, okay, that's scary. And by the way, I saw the ad that, uh, that uh, Ernie put out about having your flesh creep or something. No one's flesh is gonna creep. You might cringe a little bit, but no one's flesh, I'm not into flesh creep. All right. uh, this is another picture here with the rescued financial companies, the taxpayer bailout, they're in a, their big limousine uh, on Wall Street <coughs> saying inside, okay, let's try it again, 25,000 mile per hour speed limit, risk the only way, and heading off the cliff again. This is, this is if we don't put a stop to what's been going on for the last 20 to 30 years in terms of our economic policy and what we allow to happen, this is where we're headed. Next slide. <laughs> Another pained expression, you may know uh, who this is, uh, Richard Geithner, our man in the Treasury, Treasury Secretary. Um, this, by the way, if you don't remember his uh, confirmation hearing, Dick Geithner was the guy who couldn't pay his taxes properly. <laughs> this is Secretary of the Treasury, let's see, IRS, Treasury, he can't pay his taxes. Why? It was TurboTax's fault. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I use TurboTax. It's never TurboTax's fault. It's your fault. TurboTax doesn't make a mistake. You make a mistake. He couldn't figure out TurboTax, but this is the person that we've entrusted the largest economy in the world. Okay, whatever we're willing to swallow, this is my, my take on him. Another pained expression, what did I get myself into? Also, it is confirmation here, president of the New York Federal Reserve, which was supposed to be regulating all of these things that were going on with, on Wall Street with the credit default swaps and all this nonsense. And when he got in front of Congress, he said, well, weren't you looking at the, at the amount of risk that these financial companies were taking? And he says, well, our role isn't to be a regulator. <laughs> and everyone just stepped aside. Of course, that, that is your role. You're supposed that, that's what you do. That's what the Federal Reserve is supposed to do. It's supposed to be overseeing the financial system, the banks. Next slide. Uh, you all remember Senator Madoff, right? Uh, Bernie Madoff, this is interesting. I keep, I tell my students this. Bernie Madoff is the only big crook, quote unquote, that we've uncovered in this uh, scandal thus far, who's been sentenced. Um, $65 billion Ponzi scheme, the largest in, in history. He really had nothing to do with the financial scandal. I think uh, it was Warren Buffett or someone said correctly, uh, when you have these 
major disruptions in the financial system, it's equivalent to the tide rolling out. And when the tide goes out, what happens? You see the junk laying on the beach. <laughs> Here's the junk laying on the beach, folks. He didn't cause it. He was uncovered because of it. Because people were asking for their money, which he didn't have. He got scared. He said, uh, I think we need to pull back the money. Oh, sure. It's in the mail. Check's in the mail. No money. Next slide. Bernie Madoff, again, here's the Madoff scheme, this giant scheme which he perpetrated over decades, right? Another guru. We always have these financial gurus, you know, the Charles Keatings of the world, the Robert Citrons of the world, the Bernie Madoff. These are the guys who are smarter than everyone else. Right? Who's in his pocket? Well, there's the SEC, right? Which was in his pocket. There's a book out on that by one of Bernie Madoff's, uh, uh, Bernie Madoff's uh, competitors. Uh, I'm trying to think of his name. Uh, anyway, get his name later. And who's in the pocket? Christopher Cox. Christopher Cox. <laughs> you all remember Christopher Cox, don't you? Yes. Orange County. Yeah. Newport Beach. My congressman. <laughs> when they appointed him, when he was taking over as SEC chair, I just remember I most fainted when I was reading this. The paper. I called up two colleagues. I said, "Can you believe that Christopher Cox is now going to be the chief regulator of the entire financial system in the United States?" <laughs> And it was almost like a bad joke. But then I thought, I said, you know, and I wrote about Christopher Cox before in terms of some other things, in terms of bankruptcy and some other things he's done. And uh, clearly pro-business, you know, which is fine. But the only thing that stopped me from writing a letter to the Times or wherever, or getting out, getting out the you know, a major movement on this, was that uh, Christopher Cox also was a co-sign, a co-sponsor of the Sarbanes-Oxley bill, which was the harshest piece of corporate legislation ever passed in the United States. That was in response to Enron et al. meltdowns in 2002. Right? Didn't mention that crisis, but that was another one. So in response, the Sarbanes-Oxley, he was one of 10 or I think 10 or 15 congressional co-sponsors of that bill. I'm thinking, hmm, maybe he's seen the light. Right? Wrong, wrong. <laughs> anyway, so he's in his pocket. <laughs> pocket watchdog. And of course, if you remember, if you go back uh, historically, when the meltdown started to happen, who was the first person they pointed the finger at? It was a bunch of kids like getting caught in a juvenile you know, act, and they all pointed the finger. It was Chris Cox's fault. It was Chris Cox's fault. Well, it wasn't partly his, but it certainly he wasn't going to be the fall guy for this whole thing. I thought that was a bit unfair. Keep impression that he was all going to OK, so this is made off in prison. <laughs> and, the, and the convict is saying, he says, I'm serious. I gave him three butts, and then a month later, I got a whole cotton back. The man is a genius. <laughs> so there he is in prison, you know, doing a scam of the prison. Yes. I don't know what this one means, but someone found it. I just thought it was funny. It's the, li the police lineup. So you have George Bush over here looking like a delinquent. So you got. Uh, uh, Ed, uh, Sumner uh, from uh, Harvard, who was Obama's oh, yeah, chief yeah. economic advisor, went back to Harvard because he only could take a two year leave, so he didn't want to lose the, his Harvard job. Uh, you got uh, Obama looking like Scarface, you know, like a gangster with a cigarette. Hank Paulson, former Secretary of the Treasury, the guy who is uh, head of, um, was it uh, Goldman Sachs? Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs. Uh, becomes Treasury Secretary. And if you see, if you haven't seen the movie Inside Job, you have to see the movie Inside Job. One of the best historical pieces I've ever seen on any subject, and it explains his role very well. But there's one scene in there which is which is great. They keep talking about, well, he left this position where he was making you know tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to become Secretary of Treasury. And they cite a law that is really not well publicized. But the law is, well, you know, look at that. He's really a great public servant. Look what he did. He gave up that job for a, a government paycheck. When you do that, right, when you do that, he is allowed to not pay taxes on any of the money that he made in his former job. So the tax saving to him, they, they had a number, I can't remember, it's like $75 million or something like that, tax saving. By taking the job of Secretary of Treasury, he made $75 million. <laughs> as well as serving all of his friends on Wall Street. And of course, there's Dick Geiger again, I mean, looking like the quote unquote innocent delinquent in the corner. All right, so anyway, the usual suspects, I think 
there's a connection here. It may be a Harvard connection or something, because I think Bush got his business degree. I think they're all somehow connected to Harvard. I don't know what. Otherwise, it's just a crazy picture. All right, so next one. So what does all this have to do with law, criminology, keep pressing? <laughs> Otherwise, I, I'll never remember what I wrote. White collar crime, keep pressing. <laughs> OK. And if white collar crime was involved, why haven't there been any major prosecutions result, resulting from the current crisis? And it's easy for me to say, oh yeah, sure, it's all about white collar crime. I'm a white collar criminologist. Why should you listen to me? Right? I know it. I do it. I, I've studied it. Uh, you know, of course, I'm going to say it's white collar crime. Let's let's get into this a little bit more. Keep pressing. Keep pressing. All right. So, what does this have to do with? Keep going. Just one more. Just wait. Okay. Okay. So I want you to listen. U.S. home mortgage lending practices got out of hand in the 80s and 90s. And we know, we live in Orange County, we know people who were flipping houses, <laughs> getting into houses they couldn't afford, thinking the market was going to continually go up. The bubble was, was, inflate, was hyperinflating at that point, right? Some people got really messed up because they were buying at the, at the height, at the, just when the bubble was the biggest, when it exploded or imploded, or they left with it. The houses weren't underwater. They owed more, they, 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 the house was worth less than what they actually owed on it. A lot of this had to do with subprime loans. And there's lots of literature. I don't have time to go through it, but there's lots of literature on this. The subprime loans exploded again during a deregulatory period, brought on by people like Alan Greenspan, continued by people like uh, Bernanke. Uh, securitization of those loans, so they were, the loans were bundled, uh, sold, <coughs> Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all those places bundled them, sold them out to um, uh, financial houses that then sold them all, all over the world. So there was securitization. There were, and it, it, it's a bit complicated, but if you see the movie Inside Job, they do a very nice job of explaining the tranches and how they divided them up and how they got the seal of approval and how they rated them AAA and all that stuff, right? Uh, they were so when that was done, you literally had what was called what were called these toxic assets, which that's the polite way of saying fraudulent loans <laughs> that were packaged into those securities that were then sold all over the world, which then went bust. And then when they went bust, the counter bets on them, which were the credit default swaps, which AFG was doing, they came due, and somehow, miraculously, the government said, you know, we really owe these, these people 100 percent, 100 cents on their dollar. It's like, well, why? Well, because they're our friends. Right? <laughs> so we paid, we, meaning you, us taxpayers, paid off that entire amount. And it wasn't just the subprime loans, it was the bets that were being put out on these that really caused the scale of what we saw in terms of this crash. If you add up the subprime loans, we could probably pay that off without too much disruption. It was the counter bets against them. And this is what was going on with, uh, with uh, <coughs> um, what's the company I'm thinking of? Morgan Spud. Morgan Stanley. Lehman. 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 Uh, Goldman Sachs. Uh, the disclosure stuff they're all talking about. It gets complicated. We don't have time to go into all that. But it's basically a question of them selling these things, knowing that they were going to blow up to investors. Investors not being uh, fully aware. Uh, and a lot of inside deals going on. <clears throat> which, hence the title of that movie I keep repeating, Inside Job. <laughs> so these, there were perverse incentives for them to do to take these risks uh, because there was just lots of money to be made doing it. No regulation. There was literally under under cops at, S at the SEC, virtually no cops on the beat. <laughs> no one looking at this. Now, you could be a free market ideologue. You could be a regulatory ideologue. There's got to be some middle ground here, folks. It's not just oh the free market's going to contain it all. We've played that game for 30 years. When the free market, quote unquote, controls it all, controls nothing, and the economy <coughs> explodes on a regular basis, and increasingly, we're, uh, uh, big disasters every eight to 10 years. Now, some economists would say, oh, that's just a natural self-correction. <coughs> There's nothing natural about it. These bubbles get hyperinflated. Part of that hyperinflation is due to fraud. Not the whole thing is due to fraud, but the hyperinflation is due to fraud. And you know, physics, we have a physical, at least one physics guy here. When you hyperinflate a bubble, it it's burst. not going to slowly deflate. It will explode, which is what we constantly get with these prices. So you had this real estate bubble. Alan Greenspan, because he's a quote-unquote free market ideologue, 
doesn't believe in bubbles. So to Alan Greenspan, there was no bubble. To Bernanke, his protege, there was no bubble. That giant increase in home prices in the United States reflected, in Bernanke's words, sound economic fundamentals. <laughs> nothing, nothing could be further from the truth. And this is, and what's scary, and this is the, the flesh creepy part, I guess, or the, the cringing part is, these are the people who still run the financial system. <coughs> also we have in place in the United States, just saw this on the news last night, I was watching the news hour, PBS, and uh, you're talking about CEO executive compensation, and they had the apologist, the consultant, to quote, apologist for the uh, corporations and CEOs who are making outrageous compensation bonuses, and then someone who wrote uh, a book, I uh, can't remember the guy's name at this point, but anyway, talking about the, you know, whether they really deserve this compensation. Um, outrageous compensation systems encourage CEOs and leaders of any organization, for that matter, to take as much risk as possible. They don't really care about the health of the organization, which they may not be at for more than a few <coughs> years. It's not about long term, it's about short term. It's just a, the way our system works. It's about short term profits. Shareholders want to see the report. We need prop, short term profits. Well, the faster you drive up those short term profits, the more bonuses you're going to get. And if we don't put a stop to that or to put a lid on it, we allow people to take out outrageous risks with organizations and they get paid for it in outrageous compensation packages. Currently, and I think this just came out, government report just came out, which kind of verifies what uh, a lot of the Occupy Wall Street movement people are saying, is that we are at a point in time right now historically where there's probably never been, at least in modern times, this amount of inequality in the United States. Yeah. Where yeah. literally the top 1%, and even within that top 1%, it's the top tenth of that percent that owns most of that. It's not even 1%, it's 0.1% that owns almost 50% of the wealth in the United States. It's just, it's all gone up. It's just out of control. Uh, you could look at it culturally as kind of a psychopathic, you know, wealth thing, or you could just look at it as uh, a natural progression of corporations and corporate control, where they basically can pay these outrageous sums to executive officers. All right, so what happens when, 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 uh, when, when these kinds of really bad policies take place? Well, you have severe enforcement capacity issues over the past decade. Enforcement agencies are generally understaffed. An example of this is between 2000 and 2000, 2001, 2008, there was a 36% staff reduction in FBA, the FBI agents dealing with white collar crime. Now, there was a reason for it, but it wasn't necessary, it wasn't a, a necessary result or, or, or a result that had to happen. What happened in 2001? Bush. Bush got elected. 9-11, too. 9-11. Yeah. So we had 9-11, everybody was shifted over to terrorism. All of a sudden it was terrorism. They had a lot of FBI agents that were left over from the savings and loan debacle. Once they cleaned that up, what'd they do? They stuck them onto health care fraud. Because now they had some agents that actually could do fraud. And they had a lot more of them because Congress passed a bill to introduce more agents into the FBI to look at fraud. When 2000, when 9-11 happened, they took them all off fraud, put them on terrorism, never replaced them. Bush and everybody else said, oh, this is good. Just put them on, no one was looking at white. So what happened? 30, so you had this 36% staff reduction. Cases brought dropped by over 25%. Prosecutions dropped by more than 50%. So if you looked at the data, at the official data, we don't have a white collar crime problem. Look, it's going down. It has nothing to do with the real crime. Of course, it's just an artifact of not having any enforcement capacity. So this is called Turning a Blind Eye to Fraud. Uh, one of my favorite writers, Nobel Prize, that should be E.L. <laughs> Prize winning economist Paul Krugman. How did economists get it so wrong? This is a great article written in 2009, New York Times. You can find it online if you're interested. <clears throat> um, and I won't go into it all, but basically, uh, well, I have a couple of pieces written on that, off of that piece uh, that explain it more in criminological terms, and uh, I think I get into it in a little bit, so I'll hold off. Um, enforcement agencies got it wrong as well. Uh, enforcement agencies started to focus on the loan originators and the really the low underlying uh, uh, folks, 
the low-hanging fruit, if you will, the fish who jumped into the boat, if you will, <laughs> the real scam artists on the bottom. Nothing upstream. No one was prosecuted upstream. There still is not one major prosecution that exists in the United States from this current debacle. In the wake of the savings and loan scandal, which I was heavily involved in, and one of my students was one of the chief regulators that or be, uh, became my student afterwards, we were very involved in that. We looked, we found the data, we looked at the numbers, they had over a thousand major prosecutions in response to the savings and loan scandal. The famous one down here, you all remember, is Charles Keating, but he was only one. There were another thousand of him in the country that they nailed and put into prison. Not one in this debacle. This debacle, by the way, is something like 36 to 50 times greater in terms of cost than the savings and loan crisis, depending on how you want to do the numbers, between 30 and 50 times. Not one. Then, 20 years ago, over 1,000. So if you don't think the rich are in charge, that's one obtrusive measure to tell you that they really are in charge. So um, only minor offenses have been prosecuted. Uh, Barry Getz wrote a piece back in 1997 in Law and Society Review uh, calling this white collar crime as a non-issue. It just doesn't exist. Why? Well, because we won't commit the resources to investigating it and ferreting it out. It doesn't get reported to you. White collar crime, you have to proactively uh, uh, discover. So the role of control fraud, this is a concept that one of my students, uh, aforementioned uh, federal regulator, Bill Black, came up with as a result of his dissertation, and basically refers to this idea of crimes committed by those who run large firms that are designed to enrich themselves while victimizing their own institutions. It's a new kind of fraud, relatively new. It's kind of crime by the organization. If you want to think those are the top, well, they're the organization. Against the organization. Traditional corporate crime would usually be crimes that were committed by corporations against consumers, crimes against the environment, crimes against other countries, whatever, some other victim. No, this is the company or the, or the bank or the financial institution actually victimizing itself, its own shareholders, everyone. And literally not caring whether that organization stays alive or falls apart. <coughs> The fraud minimalist, minimalist position taken by traditional law and economics approaches fraud. These are the free market ideologues who basically say, we don't need enforcement. The chief writer in the uh, neoclassical law and economics literature, uh, Daniel Fischel, uh, David Easterbrook, two guys wrote this book. They, I could quote the book for you. They basically say, a rule against fraud is not necessary in securities markets. Why? Because markets are efficient. And markets will discover fraud on their own. You don't need cops. You don't even need laws. Because the markets ferret that out. It's a minor problem that they take care of. They've been wrong over and over again. But this is continually the policy that, that holds sway in Washington. It doesn't account for the role of control for it. They don't. The free market ideologues never consider this aspect, that you can have people in their own organizations that are only there to enrich themselves and they can care less. To them, no, the efficiency, you know, markets are efficient, they'll spot those guys and they'll be out and they'll put in new management. When? We're still waiting for that to happen. When is it going to happen? Next slide. So we saw this in the U.S. savings and loan crisis. Um, the U.S. corporate and accounting meltdowns of 2002, you saw these aspects of control fraud in each of these. Control fraud, as I mentioned earlier, hyperinflates financial bubbles, and, it's the wep and the weapon of choice is really accounting. That's why Arthur Anderson was, was involved in that. <coughs> All of those crooked SNLs couldn't have done it without accounting firms that were constituting <coughs> themselves by, by verifying their books and certifying their books. Right? And now you have the same issue with accounting as well. Economist Hyman Minsky called this the Ponzi phase of bubbles. And it's really, uh, it's a metaphorical phrase, but it's also pretty descriptive. It's like when everyone gets in, they see, oh, the market's going crazy, let's get in. And that's when all the scam artists can do their best work. That's when people make the worst decisions. So due to, it's due to a lack of regulation and enforcement, the president in what are known, what criminologists call crime-facilitated environments. You take away regulation, you create these perverse incentives for people to enrich themselves at any expense, including that of the organizations. And guess what? You can have a whole bunch of people committing fraud. 
Another issue, and I won't go through this, is a little off the point, but it's you know basically an issue of crime control versus damage.